Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos and I'm here with Brandon Del Pozo, a friend of mine and former police chief of Burlington, Vermont and former, oh, I, 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 you forgot your rank. What, what, what was your rank? I was, I was a deputy inspector. Deputy inspector. Okay. Deputy inspector of the NYPD. You're with the NYPD, I believe, for 19 years. And you were the precinct commander of uh, a few precincts, including the 6th Precinct, which covers uh, Greenwich Village, Washington Square Park. Um, I don't quite know the boundaries. Um, but I appreciate you joining me here. Um, and you may remember uh, uh, Brandon was in the last episode as well with Jeff Asher. Uh, this is, in fact, one hour after we stopped recording that one. Um, I am want to talk about the op-ed that you wrote um, in the Daily News, uh, June 11th, 2021. Today is June 13th, 2021. And um, the headline is the wrong way to police Washington Square Park, how things got so bad. Now you didn't write the headline, but that headline's okay. Um, but the articles is, um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, not just because I know you, but because you talk about, I think in some ways important issues uh, that very much relate to say, you know, Jane Jacobs um, writings on the, the same neighborhood, but 50 years ago. Um, and about policing and about public space. So um, instead of me summarizing it, can you sort of what, what say what yeah. you, you wrote? No, thanks, Peter. And thanks for your, your kind words on the article. I know you said in a, in a note, um, I would say something nice anyway as a friend, but I genuinely enjoyed it. So, uh, I, so thanks. If you're looking for it out there in the podcast world, it's available online. If you go rooting around for uh, Washington Square Park and Del Pozo or something like that with the Daily or News. I should mention, which I, I'm very bad about doing, um, uh, the website for this podcast, which is qualitypolicing.com. I'll certainly put a link up on there. Great. And in a day or two, I'll probably put a link on, on my own website uh, so you can find it. It's 850 words of, of uh, what you'll hear about today in the next hour. Um, I was the commander of the, of the West Village for uh, two years. That covers from from Houston to 14th Street, from Broadway to the to the Hudson. So Washington Square Park's right in the middle of that. This is a neighborhood in a park that that people have just a fabled vision of, right? And 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 people from all over the world want to come to Washington Square Park and and live out some fantasy of what they think is a village life. It could be fireworks at one in the morning. It could be buying weed. It could be reading a book, playing frisbee, going to NYU, and then sitting by the fountain. Not all of that works together all at once, right? And so the park has rules. Another thing it does is it resets by closing at midnight. It's closed at midnight from time immemorial. The original title I suggested that the Daily News did not take because people who've ever written an op-ed knows that the newspaper picks the title was um, you can't police a park with a pendulum. And the point I was making was not that last Saturday or, you know, from when this was recorded that the NYPD going in like with full force and pepper spray and, and, and fisticuffs and clearing the park at 10 PM was, was the problem. That was part of a much bigger problem where for weeks and weeks, uh, by all accounts, the NYPD did nothing to enforce any rules in the park that people were, in fact, up until three in the morning, playing music, setting off fireworks, drinking drugs, doing drugs, having sex. Um, and then also, also what are called um, pop up protests where a group, a, a group of uh, the same people, a couple dozen people um, night after night would. Um, would do those things you're talking about, but both will be a bit more aggressive and uh, in terms of their attitudes towards police. Right. And police are back on their heels. Since I wrote the op-ed, I had a few of my former cops contact me uh, from the 6th Precinct um, saying, listen, like when you close the precinct at midnight uh, in the know, park 20, at midnight. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. When you close the park at midnight in 2012, um, it was a different world. Now people are literally saying F you. They turn on their phones to say, make me leave. You have to fight me. This is my park. And there was a time, so I remember I handled Occupy Wall Street and there were people there at midnight saying, whose park? Our park. And I would say back to them, this is your park. It is yours. I am merely its steward. You own it. Your park closes at midnight. And they'd say, it's our park. And it, yes, it's your park. It's your park. It's yours. Your park closes at midnight. No, no, it doesn't. I say, it's your park so much so that you've elected people to make rules about it. And those people say it closes at midnight. That's exactly why it's your park because you've made these rules. And they work. They make sense as rules. You need a park 
the, we used to say the tenor of the park in the morning is set by what happens there at night. And if what happens there at night, and I say this in the op-ed and I just alluded to this, if it's drinking, drugs, sex, protest, loud music, by the time the morning comes, it's going to be urine, feces, uh, use needles, use condoms, uh, homeless encampments. It's it, the first people walking their dogs, drinking their coffee, looking to uh, commute through the park. That's not going to feel like a safe or welcoming place. And you need that breathing room for the park, like I said, to kind of recalibrate. That just wasn't happening, right? Because NYPD's approach to the park as a product of everything that's been going on in the city politically with policing had become this crazy pendulum where, where nothing, even to the point where the most permissive NYU professors were like, gee, is like, I, it, it is, I can't even sleep anymore. Please, can somebody do something? And then the response is to go in with like hundreds of riot cops and clear the place out. And that's, and I just saw that as like such a, um, such a bad way to broker the use of public space of such an important public space in New York city. Which is do nothing, do nothing. And then over, overreact or at least what it was perceived as an overreaction it also um george kelling when he was alive used to give an example i actually looked in his broken windows article and it's not in there but he used to say this a lot that the sort of his classic example of bad policing what happens when um you don't police public order and you don't do it in a legal transparent fashion and you don't do it with the support and leadership of the department of political and, and police leaders is you let a park get out of control. And um, his example was always uh, uh, bums harassing secretaries at lunch. And, uh, and they would complain to, their, to, their, to the mayor. And then eventually the mayor would tell the police chief, um, you know, get those bums out of the park. And, uh, and the police chief would, would relay that order to the officers. And then they would go in and um, use un- unplanned, unnecessary force. And, uh, and, and uh, actually, you know, I, I want to get his story right. He would say the mayor would say there's a problem with bums in the park. And then the police chief would say, get those bums out of the park. I don't care how you do it. And then when the shit hit the fan, uh, they would sort of deny accountability. Um, and these problems have to be dealt with before they get to that level of crisis. That was his point. Right. No, that's a great story by Kelling. And, and it's funny. One of the things I think we give short shrift to is um, you know, there's been a big Me Too movement. And we talk about just women feeling comfortable in the workplace. You know, there's also when you look, that there's a long history that still goes on of women feeling very uncomfortable in public spaces. And I know that this is an illustrative example. I'm not deep diving into um, street harassment, but that's a prime example of, a, of, of an uncooperative use of public space where like half the population feels like they're um, you know, one comment or leer or grope away from from um, being a victim, a legitimate victim of, of abuse in a public space, right? And parks are like that, right? If there's, if it's just NYU students, it's like in tank tops and shorts and heels or whatever, wanting to use Washington Square Park, you don't want people screaming and leering at them. Someone's got to be there to broker that use of public space fairly. Yeah. Yeah, I, you'll, you'll know I'm saying this not very sincerely, but let me play devil's advocate first to get sort of the extreme uh, opinion out here and so we can dismiss it. Um, why should we give a damn what that NYU student thinks? Um, what about why, why are you picking sides here? Um, what you're, you're well, picking, you're picking the, the whiter Asian person right, right. over the, over the, the, the poor uh, drug dependent individual who has just as much of a right to that park as anybody. Right. So, so, so the point is that, that, that works until that works as long as you're happy with the, uh, with, with the way things fall out, right. As long as, as you get to point to your version of pluralism, one of the things I talk about in my research is like, we live in a pluralist society. Um, What, what Peter didn't mention in the intro is that, you know, I, I, about a year ago, I finished my doctorate in political philosophy. What I wrote about was the, the police and the democratic state. So, right. If, 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 if you don't broker and enforce cooperation in ways that, that allows for a plurality of people to safely and comfortably use a park for different reasons, what you're literally doing is saying that the democratic spaces are owned by the people who get there first, the people who say they're the longest, the people who are the most intimidating, and the people who are the most disruptive. And if that happens to be the people who you think are victims and they're reclaiming what was always theirs, like maybe that works for you. But for, for that can turn on its on its dime in an instant. 
Um, you know, you could have um, maybe some a small group of Muslims that want to use Washington Square Park for uh, afternoon prayer. And they, they go and they face Mecca and pray. And then um, those very same people who are now screaming at the women turn around and go, get the heck out of here, Muslim, start screaming Muslim epithets. Does the logic still hold or do you now want the police to broker cooperation in a way where we're protecting the, the people at prayer? And, and, you know, my answer is you, you cannot have the, the, the test of public space use be who gets there first, who's the most intimidating, who stays there the longest and who's the most disruptive. Right. Because, you know, who, who doesn't suffer from that? The um, frankly, the, the wealthy. Right. The the wealthy will say, well, you know, it's NYU. We're paying tuition. The park isn't what we hoped it would be, but we have so many student spaces where we can take advantage of this. The student hall right to the south of the park, and it's just beautiful atrium like they'll just go there. And, you know, who's not getting in there like the homeless dudes. Um, the wealthy will say, I used to like to take my uh, my weekend stroll after exiting the townhouse in Washington Square Park. I guess it's going to have to be the Hamptons who really <laughs> suffers from the most disruptive use of the park are the people oh, that have no choice but to use the park. I hear the commute to the Hamptons can be horrible. Traffic. It, it I mean, the, hel the, the helicopter, you know how many helicopters, you know, the landing, you have to might like hover well, in your helicopter while the other guy's helicopter takes off so you can land. Because oh, there's like horrible, the helicopter. Horrible. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, the claiming of public space, to me that, by the way, is a good, because you, we do live in a diverse pluralistic society. You don't want to impose one person's or one group's concept of, of acceptable, <clears throat> acceptable behavior up to a point. And a good rule of thumb is, does one person's or group's behavior prevent other people from using it? Are they stealing that public space? And if the answer is yes, for the sort of reasons you, you, you mentioned, um, then there's a problem. Or it has to be heavy, you know, or it has to be regulated in a cleared way. I mean, you could argue, by the way, that a softball team claims public space at a softball field. And that's why it's a permitted process, because mm -hmm. when that team is there, yeah, you actually, you're not allowed to use it. Um, that's kind of a big deal. Like, of course, we understand whatever people want to play sports and some of them are organized. So we allow that. Um, that is a little, you know, fundamentally different than someone who claims public space because they are um, mentally insane because they're crazy and, no, listen, and if, talking if, to if, themselves angrily. If the Sharks and the, and the Jets have a softball team, right? Um, and they both want to play uh, on that space, like what, what, the, what the permit process does. And you need a permit to have a sound amplification device in Washington Square Park. You need a permit to have a meeting uh, um, of more than 10 people, unless I believe it's a, even protests actually, but don't quote me on that. But the whole idea of a permitting process is to ensure fair access to a public space. So if the Sharks and the Jets have softball teams um, and there's no permitting process, the Sharks and the Jets will literally be battling it out to, to, to play softball and the one that's the bigger, more intimidating or better armed or gets there first and holds it, gets to use the softball field. No, that's why we have a permit process. That's why you need a permit process to play music through an amplification device in Washington Square Park for weeks and weeks and weeks. That was completely unenforced. DJs were coming in and setting up till three in the morning. But there is this, this we need our, our police to impose at least some sort of reasonableness assessment. Like, if it's some loud music on a Friday or Saturday night, you might want to say, well, you know, okay, person making the noise complaint. You're in Greenwich Village on a Friday or Saturday night. Like you got to deal with this. But like on a Sunday morning or, or on, a, on a Wednesday night, no, that, that's an unfair use of the space, right? So it's not just like these, these codified rigid rules about like, like decibels. And no, there's a lot of common sense about time, place, and manner that, that and it's why policing is, is hard. And it's not just noise. I mean, I don't want to downplay noise. I live in the city. Uh, you know, it's also um, needles, drug, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's public prostitution. Uh, it's, you know, we're not just talking about, oh, just a DJ, though. Again, if you live, yeah, to have amplified music at 3 a.m., I think it's fair to say at some point you got to turn it off. Um, you know, we went through this with Tompkins Square Park back in the, was that in the 80s or 90s? Mm, I think that was the early 90s. Um, it must have been because it because uh, that was the era in which things changed. Yeah. Um, and that was a park that was seen as uh, taken over by certain disruptive groups. Um, and it must have been Giuliani, right? Who uh, they sealed off mm. the park, 
nominally for repairs, which I think I'm sure they did some repairs, but it was basically to clear it out. And there was a bit of a, a riot and a brawl uh, when they cleared out Tompkins Square Park and then it stayed closed for a while and, um, you know, reopened, uh, but for the use of all. Um, you know, a lot of this does, and, and you probably, I don't know, you might find her too simplistic, but it's a level of writing I can understand because I was just a sociology major and not a philosophy major, but you know, this goes back to Jane Jacobs' death, life of great American cities. Um, and this idea of, of shared public space building on each other. And she talked very much about neighbors and community enforcing certain standards, but her point was standards have to be enforced. And um, she said, look, in some neighborhoods, every building has a doorman, uh, they can afford it. Uh, but those are certain standards being enforced. Um, and policing plays an important role of that in the, in the safety of the sidewalk. Right. No, there's this idea. And it's so interesting that you bring up Jane Jacobs because, right, one of her things that she, so this is a woman who fought like the most powerful uh, real estate uh, and, and public works people. Robert and, Moses. Yeah. yeah, Robert Moses. The Power Broker is a great book, right? By, um, oh God, Caro, uh, Robert Caro. So, yeah. Yeah. But anyway. I was going to Photoshop nothing but power broker books behind me. Just kind of cliche. <laughs> no, listen, she, you know, they were going to build a elevated highway down fifth Avenue through Washington square park. And uh, she fought that off. So she's not some just well, pro just, just, development. Not that it matters. The elevated highway wasn't through Washington square park. They were going to expand the road through Washington square park. The elevated highway was uh, across, uh, across lower Manhattan. No, no, no. Thank you. But I wasn't wrong in thinking that they were going to decimate Washington square park. Right. So, yeah. As, as they had done other parks in New York. City. And, and she brings up the idea of, of their, you know, she's not some knee jerk stoolie to the power class, quite to the contrary. And she still brings up the idea that like order is important where she and I differ a little bit is that she really, really relied on um, informal social control to get things done. She talked about basically, if you read the beginning of, of, of Death and Life, a great American city, she talked about Greenwich Village being um, special and a model because it had uh, a very strong informal social control. If your kids are out there getting in trouble, the shopkeeper sees them, tells your mom, your mom hauls you in by the ear. You're, she does it in front of your neighbors. You feel ashamed. This like informal regulation where that falls apart a little bit is she was not talking about a very heterogeneous uh, neighborhood. She's talking about a fairly homogenous West Village. It was predominantly white, predominantly left-leaning, predominantly artistic. The cultural expectations were basically the same. So I think she's onto something that you want these, this, this type of order. But one of the things I, I feel is, is in a city in a neighborhood that's become as diverse as the West Village has, and especially who it attracts, you can't just let the informal order run it, right? In that case, it would be, if you're looking at, at that, it would be like a, just a lot of fairly, um, if, if it's about bullying and getting in that space and seizing it, it's gonna be a certain activist class. Just we're here. I defy you to make us leave. Go F yourself. If you have a problem, this is the First Amendment. And if it's about like where the police take their cues from, it's going to be NYU and people who own townhouses. And so I think that to, to thread that needle, if you see what I'm getting at, is like one of the hard jobs policing has is to truly enforce pluralism in a much more heterogeneous place than Jane Jacobs lived in when she was uh writing i don't know if you agree with that but. I, that no that makes a lot of sense though i do i wonder if the west village in itself was more diverse in her time in different ways with more blue collar workers i mean the docks were well, definitely active. more economically right right but, but the point is the blue collar worker like everybody had there was no you know should we reserve this place for muslim prayer should it be hip-hop or the symphony like there were there symphony orchestras in, in washington square park there's also hip-hop in washington square park right there's yeah. weed smoking but also cocaine cocaine snorting but also you know injecting meth and, and heroin like it's she not just she did not have to deal with iv drug use problems back then or, or crystal meth which also and if they did it was yeah, it, it was a different whole different type of of, of ecology that's right as, as so, the former precinct commander there who, who gave you your marching orders? How much independence did you have? Oh, so number one, I'd like to take this opportunity to say I feel terrible for the uh, the rank and file cops that have to um, be on the on the the, the the to mix my metaphors on the tip of this pendulum, right on the fighting end of the pendulum. Like 
do nothing. The people can use the park for whatever they want. Like, don't bring us collars from Washington Square. So and then I, like five, six. I should later, say I have it. Get on, in there at midnight. Yeah. I yeah. have it on a reliable ahead, source that with the protests that started post George Floyd, but have again continued with a few dozen people with these sort of pop up protests where they try to graffiti up the monument and throw things at cops um, that cops have been told not to arrest people for such right. things as breaking a window of a store unless there is intent to loot, at least not the first time. Um, cops have been told not to arrest people for for tagging in their presence. Um, and the idea that you're telling cops not to respond to crimes in their presence strikes me as a bad, well, it's bad policy. Um, but so there is- right. And so they don't- they, no, 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 Peter, they don't always have to make an arrest, but they, they do have, have to have to. the prerogative to respond. But they're right? being That's told the not to. That's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm clarifying. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I just want to bring out a, a distinction that the, that the listener um, hopefully keys in on, which is it's one thing for cops to just maniacally arrest everybody who tags in their presence, and they shouldn't do that. But to say um, you don't even have the discretion to decide what to do is is antithetical to like just decent policing well, in but I any also think city people who sort of criticize police enforcement um because it picks on vulnerable or is, is racially disproportionate to the city's overall population which is an absurd denominator but i've talked about that before um it, but depends on what people are doing if you if you don't enforce those rules you shift the standard of acceptable behavior um you do move things like it, the point of, of enforcement is not to arrest people it's to change behavior it's to maintain a behavior to say mm -hmm. this is a line you don't cross and maybe you have to enforce it once to say to sort of say i'm serious about this but the point is people will respond to that um arresting is the or else for police stop that you're misbehaving stop that you know why because if you don't i'm going to lock you up if you lose that or else police if they have no legal authority they they lose their moral authority right so arrest arrest in my in my book serves two two purposes one is to in cases where in cases where the government has an interest in adjudicating something about your behavior when when when, when your behavior is worthy of possible sanction right the cops got to bring the people and the evidence to the judge they, they do that literally by arrest right by by seizing the person, seizing the evidence, bringing them to the judge, that then the, the that wonderful systems, you know, does its thing. Whole other seventeen podcasts. But the other thing that arresting does, when you look at the word arrest, like arrest, the root of the word is to stop, right? And what arrest does is it empowers the police. Not in the case of like when you're arresting somebody for a past rape, you're not stopping anything. It's not an arrest in the root of the word sense. It's saying that person did something that we're really interested in learning more about to figure out whether to sanction them. Here you go. Let's not look at recidivism. Let's just look at past accountability. Arrest that we're talking about today in this podcast in Washington Square Park is, is the police power to disassemble a situation that shouldn't be allowed to persist because it's wrong, unfair, or dangerous, right? And there's a lot of folks out there saying, wrong and unfair. How dare the police say Anything about what's wrong and unfair. Like, if, if you really feel that, that the government should have no role in determining what's wrong and unfair, have at it. I'm getting out of here, going to a place where the government does get to say that. Because what you're talking about is a place where I don't want to live because, again, the, the people, because it's just going to devolve into the most powerful, intimidating, getting their first dis disruptive people, like defining civic space for the rest of us. And so what arrest does is, is arrest turns off the DJ speakers Arrest stops the desecration of a monument. Arrest stops the destruction of property. Arrest stops kids on a corner drinking, screaming at women. Hey, I literally watched a kid say once to a woman, I would sell my sister to have a night with you. And I said, like, get off this corner. You can't be standing on a corner saying that to women. Like, no women should have to walk down the street, hear you saying that to them. Like it, 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 in so many levels and, and I didn't arrest them, but I arrested their behavior. Like that's, that's, that's important that you, you want, the problem is we worry it wasn't done fairly. We worry that like you really clamp down on that behavior in some communities and not others that like lacrosse bros get to say that in college all the time, but then you don't get, you know, 
we can dive into it, but to say that we got to throw the baby out with the bathwater and stop regulating this type of stuff is, is, is just a terrible de- devolution in our, in our community. I really like that turn of phrase, actually, the arresting behavior concept. Um, that's, yeah, police can do that without actually putting handcuffs on one on, and legally mm-hmm. arresting them. Um, you know, I mean, it does, they're all clear, you know, policing is a verb, uh, but the idea is, yeah, there's a, you know, hey, hey one, one more thing before. No, no, because I, I got to get this out because I want to start spreading this idea. You and I could be accolades of this. The uh, when you replace police with non-police to do the same thing, what they don't have is that power of arrest that I just described. And I don't mean the handcuff. I mean, the disassembly. So let's let's replace everything I just said with the social worker. So there's these rambunctious kids on a corner screaming at women saying, get out of here. The women are calling the police. I'm afraid with my daughter and I to walk down the street. Every time I walk down the street, I get followed for half a block by a guy uh, who smells of liquor saying, I want to sell my sister to fuck you. Um, Can you please do something about this? So we're not sending the police. They're terrible. We're sending the social workers. Social worker gets there. What the police have the power to do under the law and under city charters to say, whether you like it or not, I'm not leaving until we figure out what to do. What, what, What we figure out to do might be arresting you, it might be physically moving you. It might be warning you. It might be talking to you. It might be it might be procedural justice that would warm the heart of Yale Law School, where I ask about your history, your motivations, why you're doing this. I give you options. We decide. We shake hands. You go whatever it is. I'm not leaving. And I explain my out. process the entire right. time. Yeah. Right. I could see. Like I figure I, that has certain limits. I was alluding to that in my tone of voice. But bring the social worker there. Kid says, "Get out of here right now. I have nothing to say to you." And the social worker, no, 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 I, no, get out of here. You are now violating my rights. You are the government in my face. Leave. That social worker has no recourse under the law, has no recourse under charter. They have nothing to do at that point except leave or just stand there. And while, literally, the only other thing the social worker can do, if the kid says, fine, you're welcome to stay here, you get to watch me scream at these women. And then as the social worker stands there and the kid screams, the social worker can do nothing. We've got to solve that problem if we're going to change the if if we're serious about non-police responding to these situations, we have to account for this possibility in some way that that shifts the balance of power back to that woman walking down the street. Well, why the social worker should get to the root cause of why that person is drunk and harassing women. Um, yes, yes, we should live in a, a much more just utopian society than we live in now, where people never have to do these things. Um, I agree. We should change the structure of things. The um, yeah, the problem is, as you get off from my tone of voice, that doesn't help the immediate issue of the woman being harassed. Um, but I also find some, you know, sometimes it's not about the criminal, or, how, or the drug addict. How can we help, or the homeless person? Well, how can we help them? I don't know. Again, I'm you know, my I focus on policing issues, so. I, you know, if other people want to deal with those issues, please do. They need to be dealt with. But if you have a homeless encampment in the fountain in Washington Square Park, and I don't believe there is one, I'm saying this hypothetically, um, well, it's an issue about, you know, affordable housing. No, actually, no, the only issue is tents in the fountain of Washington Square Park. Um, that it's not about them, it's about the public, it's about everyone else. Um, I feel, I mean, also, you know, it's it's a lot of the debate, but also in a way, the way our legal system is set up, it's the public doesn't get a voice. Um, right. No, 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 no. To bring it back to the, the framing that I was using, you know, when I was chief of police of Burlington, Vermont, there were homeless encampments in a few places in the city. And where we drew the line was if the homeless encampments were in a place where where people traditionally by rights, like made a lot of shared use of that space, you couldn't be in camp there. If they were in more distant parts of the city where like people, like I understand this is quote unquote public space, but like no one's in the back corner of this park ever. Look, we're not, we're not gonna tear down that encampment pro forma. We let many of those go for months and months. Some are still going. There was a place on Sears Lane. It was city land that still, ha- because no, it was nominally public land, but the public actually wasn't making a, a, a pluralist claim to use. But when you were on the bike, when you were 10 feet off the bike path in downtown Burlington by the shore where there's hundreds and hundreds of people with their dogs, with their children, roller skating, you know, uh, bike riding, that that is legitimately contested space. Like you could not have your encampment there. Same thing with, with Washington Square Park. Like if you're up in Inwood Park in the far reaches and we're just looking to, to bust chops up there for an encampment, you know, 
um, or somewhere deep in Central Park where, where people aren't jogging or, or um, bushwhacking. That's one thing. But like Washington Square, every inch of that is, is legitimately pluralist space. Well, you're not allowed to encamp in Central Park, which I always, I mean, what I find interesting is even people who say don't enforce rules or don't um, still actually believe rules should be, we draw the line somewhere. Um, for instance, you know, under de Blasio, transit police, and at that time, homeless outreach, NYPD homeless outreach started tolerating uh, homeless people in, in subways. Um, that was a policy change. It wasn't a law change and it wasn't a change in homelessness in New York City. It was simply um, where people used to be ejected for violating rules. Um, again, it wasn't, you know, because they were homeless. If you, if you can sit on the subway, no one knows your housing status. Uh, it was specific behavior and that changed. Help was offered. And if people declined help, then, um, you know, they were let be. We don't allow that in Central Park. Um, so that's still a line we draw. So in a way, we sort of, sort of because well, in, there, there are a lot of rich people in the Central Park Conservatory, they don't tolerate that. So now Washington Square Park has sort no, of been fought for. Right, and it's, it, it, it's not, I, I hate to think it's just the rich people. You and I tweeted back and forth about um, homelessness in the subways. The subway is like, is like the, the, the lifeblood of um, a working class pluralist city. Like, you know, there's a lot of super wealthy folks taking the subway in New York because it's that type of city. Um, but the subway is like, it's, it's, it's how my mom got to work. It's how I got to school. It's how I've never, I remember visiting New York city from uh, Burlington and taking the subway to my parents' place down in, in Bensonhurst, which is now Hispanic and Chinese used to be Jewish and Italian, like a good working class immigrant neighborhood. I remember just looking around in that subway car, people like literally thigh to thigh, shoulder to shoulder, more diversity in close quarters than like any other place I'd seen anywhere since I left New York. If you don't feel, and, and this is not just recreation, this is how people get to school, it's how people get to work, it's how people get to job interviews, it's how people get to the doctor, it's how people recreate, you know, when they're going out for the night. If you don't feel comfortable in the subway, if you don't feel safe because there's somebody literally like living next to you under dire conditions, it, nothing degrades like the, 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 the literally it's, it, it, it hardens its plaque in the, I'm straining with my metaphors, in the arteries of a city. Like subways and, you know, subways, and again, they're not this gilded thing. They're this thing that anybody who can pay the nominal fee to, and now they stop enforcing that, but like anybody who can pay the nominal fee has access to to get to work or to get to school or to get on with their life. That space needs to be genuinely welcoming to everybody. It can't be a place where other people just start living, right? The, the hardening of the artery uh, metaphor, which I noticed followed up on the lifeblood metaphor. I'm trying. Uh, but but um, th there's something there, and I don't know what it is, but um, certainly the person who is suffering is should be in a way the greater concern, but there's something bad for society when we are basically told to um, literally step over people in need who have declined help. I don't think they have the mental capabilities often to do that, but the way our society is, is if can, you know, can we offer you help? And they say, no, I wanna be left alone. And so the rest of us are supposed to climb over people who clearly, it's not humane. It's not good for them. It's not good for us. Um, Listen, I remember in 1994, 95, I was still living in Bensonhurst. I was, I was home from college and I was visiting this hardware store on 13th Avenue in um, Brooklyn. So the hardware store owner was this um, Italian family and they were like, our daughter um, and her friends just got into Stuyvesant in High School, the high school I went to, public school, um, take a test to get in. I know that they're looking at the equity of that test, but nonetheless, you take this test, you get in and it's a great public school. And the parents were like, I... I we're not going to let our daughters go to Stuyvesant. Um, and I said, why? I said, going there changed my life. Like I never, I thought I would be lucky to go to college. You go to Stuyvesant day one, public school free. They tell you, if you go here, you can go to any Ivy League school you put your mind to and you can get a good scholarship. And it changed my view of the world overnight. Um, they said, we're not, we don't want our daughters on the train. 
And I couldn't tell them, hey, like I, my, I, I had a, I saw people get stabbed on the train. I was robbed on the train. I had to fight kids with mace on the train. I saw other people, like a kid tried to rip my gold chain off my neck on the train. I, I couldn't say to them in good faith, like, nah, don't worry about it. It was say, I'm like, no, I, it's, it is a shame that your daughters, as the daughter of, of a hardware store owner, can't go to the best high school in New York City because she's got to take the train because you legitimately, with good cause, don't feel safe. Over the course of four years, she's going to witness something or something's going to happen, right? Yeah, That is a huge problem with fairness and equity in a city. What year was that, did you say? I forget. Like I know I was in college and they were... So was, I want to say like... <sighs> It was sometime, I, I could have been maybe a senior or something at Stuyvesant. So sometime between 92 and 94. I remember thinking when the um, the Metro card was introduced, which was around that, about that time, that, uh, oh, there's no way it'll work because people, you can't take out your wallet when you're in the subway. <laughs> Listen, that was the time where I had like, you know, two places for money. You had the the... The wallet that you would give to the mugger with like, you know, it had to plausibly like it had your ID or something. It's something that, that when you looked at it, it was like, this is definitely the dude's wallet, not the fake wallet. And then you had your wallet with your actual money in it. Right? So ra- rather than two old dudes talking about the uh, the old days, let me get back to Washington Square Park. How sure. do you police it? How do you actually what are the nitty gritty? It's one thing to say, OK, we're 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 in agreement. We we're each other's choir. We're preaching to about the need for yeah. public order in the park. So you're. Um, let me start actually with a, what worries me about what's going on now, and then then you can go off that or answer the question. Um, so I don't, and I don't understand. I would prefer if I did know the answers to this. I don't understand why the curfew was the park closing. That is, was moved up from twelve to ten. Seems like whatever you're going to do, you can do it at the traditional hour. You're just causing trouble by saying, "Oh, and we're coming in two hours earlier." I don't know if there was good cause for that or not. The other thing is, once you do go in with force because you were to uh because you didn't police public order up to now um then in a way you have to keep your gains you have to but then apparently because there was a new york post article two people they just, they just went back to the way it was right yeah that there was another dance party uh and it was a party until two people got stabbed and as reported in the paper um one of the victims who identified himself as psycho willie was uncooperative um i, I was psycho wilson was a psycho Wilson. Okay. Um, that to me is a red flag. The man who identifies himself as um, psycho Wilson and, uh, and is also a, involved in a stabbing and, and is uncooperative. Um, uh, yeah. I don't, he shouldn't be in the park at 2 AM if he can't behave. I mean, um, no, listen, and I want to get, I, 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 you say I get emotional literally over um, this idea of, of, I'm not looking to cast. So I had social workers working in the Burlington Police Department. They were wonderful people. They added tremendous value to what we did when they dealt with uh, homeless people, when they dealt with people with uh, mental health crises. But they did it alongside the police. So the way we did it was you, they, they acted independently. Um, they were out there um, often by themselves engaging in lieu of the police. But whenever there was a worry of danger or whenever somebody was saying, F you, I'm out of here, the police were there to say, no, no, you the social worker can't stick around whether you like it or not, but I can. We've now entered the zone where we're not going anywhere. And when you mess with the social worker, you're messing with me. So um, we have to figure that out because the alternatives we're hearing when we talk about how to police the park are, are just getting the police out of it. And there's this, there's this promissory note that like social workers have this magic dust that when they sprinkle it on situations, gains voluntary compliance. Like I call it the, the de-escalation dap. They, they just learn this magic thing. and, and De-escalation and, dust, right, right. You sprinkle it on things and it, they de-escalate. And, and there's, there's this promissory note that like an unarmed person with an open mind, with a social work disposition will just gain voluntary compliance in ways that uh, the police can't because of who they are and who the other one is. Hey, like let that me, might so, be true hey, in many cases. Not, that's not going to be true in a bunch of cases. But let me, and I, I hope ahead. you have an answer for this. This is a serious question. What the hell can a social worker do that a cop can't? The idea is that social workers have more specific training. They're specialists. Like they're not going to bust up an armed robbery. They're not going to pursue bank robbers. They're not going to, you know, turn on the infrared camera and the helicopter and look for the kid lost in the park at night. But, when it comes to dealing with somebody suffering from addiction or mental illness, they take in like the coursework. 
that allows them to understand behavioral health, allows them to understand um, addiction, allows them to understand like the, 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 the way mental health plays out is behavior and they can communicate in ways, talk in ways, appeal to them in ways that number one, um, communicate with them better and connect better, right? Then number two, um, they have a better understanding of what treatment might, you know, the cop might not know, is this, is this a person who needs to go to a methadone clinic? Maybe a PCP prescribing buprenorphine is better. Maybe I can bring them to a syringe exchange. Ideally, the social worker understands the typologies enough to know the best referrals, right? And then because they're ingrained in that culture, they make the best referrals and they do it from a position of trust, not um, I'm the cop, I've got a gun, do this, you go to jail, but I, I don't even have a gun. I'm here just because I care about you. And I know I know about addiction. Let me help. Like, that's and, the proposition. And did you see that? And it does that is that's the theory. Does that use did it? Is it true? I think I think it gets you uh, further in a lot of cases than the police have managed to get, especially when dealing with mental health and addiction. But it doesn't get you all the way there. There's a huge yawning gap between the added value in certain cases and then the rest of the of the cases. Right. And then we can work to fill that gap or maybe I'm overstating, you know, if you're, if you're being um, pushing back, maybe I'm overstating how yawning that gap is. The bureaucrat in me also feels like if you're doing to going to do this separately from the police, you truly don't understand how complicated that's going to be in a big city to say, we're going to have the system that dispatches police, then a parallel system that has nothing to do with the police that also responds to things in lure instead of the police in the same geography 24 seven in a, in, in a, in a, a walled off way. Like that is a, a bureaucratic nightmare that, that, and it's going to be expensive. There's also the idea of you're trying to get willing cooperation. And I think the same voices that would say, we don't want the government or police imposing a sense of morality or, or bourgeois behavior um, on society. What some people want to drink shoot up and have sex in the park. Um, that is, that's their choice. Uh, they want you not to be there because I don't know, I, they prefer to have the park to themselves. I mean, yeah. Um, the, the idea that, okay. that, 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 so that you're, we're going to convince them necessarily of, of the behavior we want. No, I want to play loud music. This is not, this is like, you want, you don't, you can ask me and, and politely and try to get cooperation, but at some point, yeah, as you say, I, yeah, fuck off. Um, I choose this. Um, that is also where I guess what I'm getting at, uh, and I don't think these are mutually exclusive. And you, you, you know, one does not mean you shouldn't do the other. Um, <clears throat> but there is an element of coercion to police. That's in sort of why we have them. Going back to Bittner's concept of the use of force, um, I'm saying that is not necessarily a bad thing. No, listen, one of the things I have um, come to realize is that, you know, I'm an independent politically. Um, I've tended to vote Democrat in the last several elections. Very, very rarely, if ever, vote Republican. And I say that to say, because I'm about to say this, the left wing wants to be just as coercive as the right wing just to achieve different ends. Like they, they want to, you know, in fact, in some cases, even more so, like I would prefer to keep a fair amount of the money I make, the government's going to tell me I am taking that money, whether you like it or not. If you don't give it to me, I'm seizing it electronically and taking your, your assets away. And I'm going to do certain things with it, whether you like it or not, that I think of the things we're going to do. Like that's the one of the things about um, a very social work and social service intensive government is that it is a very, very coercive apparatus. It's just coercive in a different way. Like if you you are going to labor and then whether you were sent to it or not, the government, like, you know, Bill Gates, I'm not giving up my taxes. We're taking we're taking 40 percent of it and if 50 percent. And if you don't give it up, we're literally the government's coming and seizing it from you. And then but, on the front but, end. But, yeah, but I want to keep it away. From, but I want to keep it away from um, that part of coercion, which I mean, the political part. I just simply mean I want to play really loud music. I want a car with straight pipes. Um that you know sounds like gunfire every time I go down the street, which only started appearing last year just as shootings went up, which is unfortunate. Um, someone can say that, and I can say I don't want you to do that. At some point, one of us right. Will win. So here's the thing, and, and I'm not, I wasn't trying to be clever. Like here's the the point I'm trying to make is government is inherently coercive, and some of the differences is the level at which it's coercive and the goals of its mm -hmm. coercion. So if someone says to you. 
Um, unlike the right wingers, I'm against coercion. I'm like, no, you just want a different type of, you want like front end mega coercion that, that takes money and does certain things with it with your proposition that that would mean on the, on the bottom end, less coercion in the streets. Right. And ultimately I'm going to maybe be evasive, but like democracy will play that out. Like if, 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 if people want that street level coercion where the, where the, the, the sex haver and the drug injector and the loud music player and the homeless and camper, like get to, they're doing everything and we're not, we're offering them services. They're refusing. Then we're going, well, well, freedom, do it. It's not your fault. There's a lot of things going on. Please don't let us, you know, get in the way of, of, you know, we're not going to arrest you or coerce you because there's a lot of antecedent causes to what led to your behavior. And it's unfair to do that. Like, like that's, that's what put Giuliani in office. Right. I've said this, and I say this as someone who has literally never voted for a Republican in my life. Well, I did vote for Bloomberg, but I'm not saying, I'm not a little, like when I was like party. 18 years old. I'm sure I, I voted for. Um, hey, there, there's. I'm not going to fault you for that, but I actually people say I vote for the best person. Actually, no, I, I vote for the party. I'll, I'll, I, I've never voted for a Republican. I hope I can keep that up. Fine, I, I think I voted because... like for George Bush. Like that's probably the last uh, Republican. I, not not George Bush. Junior, like I'm talking about, like literally when, George I was, was senior. when I was 18. Yeah. Um, I, oh, yeah. Well, anyway. Well, of course, I voted for the Greek. Um, <laughs> yeah. Was I even old enough to vote? Yes, I was old enough to vote then, I think. Uh, the, um, but what <laughs> was Oh, about the politics. I, I do worry about this. And I say this as a, a Democrat. Um, if, and Biden's actually pretty good on this. But if we on the moderate left, I'm sort of giving up on the extreme progressive left don't have a lowercase law and order policy. If we see that either by just pretending it's not a problem or, you know, more radically saying police are the problem to be abolished. Um, we see that to the Trumpian right. Um, and that. And you don't want them to have control over that. You don't want them. This is, this is a matter of populism, right? And you don't want to give them that populist imprimatur. Not, not to cut you off, but like right now, as we're talking in a few days, I think like on Tuesday, like in a day or two is the is the Democratic primary for the New York City mayor's race. Yeah. And in the beginning of all this, way back when, it was like the far left progressives that were leading in the polls. After the city got more violent, after the city got more um, disruptive, after people saw um, things that alarmed them happening in the streets, the, the leader, as of two days before, of the um, um, Democratic primary is a... Uh, is a former New York city cop. Right. And, and that Eric is, Adams, yeah. yeah, Eric Adams. That's what will, you know, and, and he's a reform minded cop. Um, he's African-American. Um, but I told some other folks in the political sphere, like the, the don't think that the black community doesn't value uh, safety, doesn't value order. It isn't proud that, that a man running for mayor ascended the ranks of the NYPD to become one of its executives. Don't think that that won't matter at the polls, especially after a year of dramatically increased shootings in those neighborhoods, dramatically increased gun violence, increased burglaries, increased auto theft, and a worry that like the city's unable to do the little law and order things that you just described. Like people will, will vote, not vote with their feet. They will actually vote and put people in office that make the promise to do the coercive things that you just described, Peter. Well, also I'm thinking, um, I just I read this a few days ago. There was the union that represents school safety agents um, pointed out explicitly that uh, their union is vastly disproportionately black and Hispanic and female. And um, if they did not, I think, blame specifically white progressives, that's me. But if white progressives get their way, often you don't send their kids to these schools. If they get their way to get school safety agents out of schools, um, the social workers that replace them uh, will be disproportionately white um and then and i thought that was interesting that that union straight up <laughs> played the race card on that one um but yeah why i mean it was also a policy issue that i think it would be an absurd policy um but i don't know you know before we, we we were talking about rich people getting their way in washington square park and it's not you're right it's not just about rich people but rich people do have more voice you know their voice is heard louder at the levels of, mm -hmm. of policing and politics undoubtedly um i think that's just sort of yeah, not necessarily good, but that's just the way it is. Um, no, I mean, I, I right. But, I, I think if you ask me how to police the park, because I, I know I quickly like took us on a detour. You want to police it in a way where 
I think you can appeal to rules of order and decency, but it, number one, they have to respect pluralism. Like the, the noise rules that you enforce on um, a Monday night are not the ones that you enforce on a Friday night, right? Um, there will be a time where on one day a year where there's nothing but a huge pillow fight and other people have to deal with the pillow fight. That's not the day you're gonna just sit and quietly read Chekhov, um, right? Um, you cannot entirely eradicate uh, we dealing from Washington Square Park, it just won't happen. But that doesn't mean it should be an open air market where that takes over the space. It becomes this commercial space for, for drug sales, right? And it has to be done in a way where you don't feel like you're being targeted because of some aspect of your identity, like your race or um, your gender, your sexual orientation. So it can't just be like, you know, every time, like we get to play a lot of loud music when it's the symphony, but then hip hop never gets to be loud. Like that can't be, right? Or, um, you know, the, the kids playing soccer isn't allowed, but playing ultimate Frisbee is allowed. You see what I'm saying? Like, so it, you, you can't privilege a conception of the good that, that falls out along the lines of, of, of race or class. But beyond that, I think, I think a lot of that will or won't pass the smell test. People, even the, when people are being rambunctious, a lot of times they know what they want to see what they can get away with. Like the kids in the last few weeks, like partying at two in the morning, like they got it in their head that that was a okay. But deep down inside, they're like, yeah, I am being super loud and I'm sure I'm keeping people awake. And what did they say? They said, well, it's just rich people. Like there's a lot of comments in Gothamist, a lot of comments in the paper where the people fighting the response of well, you're, you're like driving people insane. It's two in the morning. The music is way too loud. You're having a DJ party in a park surrounded by private homes at two in the morning. And, and the, the South side is mostly NYU. The North side uh, is, is private residences. And then beyond it, a block away, we can still hear it's, it's all private residences. And their answer was, I don't give a crap. They're rich. Like, okay. <laughs> so if you were the CEO of the sex precinct, um, how, how do you set what, what do you, first of all, is it in your authority as the commanding officer of the sex precinct? Um, or do you have to follow orders from above or, you know, so what do you, what do you do? No, it's that type of place where there's always going to be a citywide interest in what you're doing. When I was the commander of the six, I brought down some cops from the Bronx from my prior command. And they were actually excited in this way that like is backward, but well-intentioned. They're like, man, we were busting people's butts in the Bronx for smoking weed and drinking. And now we're going to do that to the kids in the West village. We do that to NYU students. And I supported that. I said, if we were under, tremendous pressure to be very strict about weed and, and beer in the Bronx. If that's the pressure I dealt with for years, you know, we, we want to make sure you're really enforcing that. Um, then we're going to do it to the kids in the West village. Kids came in crying. Like you, you were smoking a joint in a park in the middle of the day. Like, and my cops literally said the ones I brought down, um, we're glad we're getting to treat NYU students the way we were we were asked to treat black people in the Bronx for years. You know what? Like after 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 not too long, um, commanders were like, "Why why is there so many? What's happening in your precinct? What, what's what, what's going on with those enforcement numbers?" And we're like, "We're just doing exactly what we did in the Bronx." And, and it was like, "Well, maybe you should revisit that." That maybe not, uh, BS. Like it, it 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 was it was infuriating. Were you so? Were you cracking down in the Bronx because you had a moral objection to to the mar to the marijuana, or because um, it, you were you're worried about more serious crimes? No. So it, it wasn't. It wasn't a quota, I will say, but it was, you know, they want the guidance was like, take a firm hand with this. And nominally, the thought is um, people coming home at night, like from a long day's work, don't need like a vestibule full of marijuana smoke. When and that is to exactly where robots. I was going to go next was that what do you do about people who don't want to walk through a lobby full of, of marijuana smoke? They deserve that, right? I mean, they deserve not to have to walk through or drunken kids smoking marijuana screaming at everyone walking through um you know and and yes that's why we so the point is to like enforce those things without moderation to enforce those things without respect to to any sort of like if if, if you're up on the rooftops waiting for the kid to light marijuana with his friend on a rooftop like you're probably which which we would do um, or on the upper, 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 upper landing, right by the roof door where the smoke's going out the door. And it's like a Saturday night. Like that's not, 
that's where it went in my opinion too far like the, what who you're interfering with the other person going to the roof like what's the of, of the apartment building and i don't mean the roof like a roof deck like if you're if you're a listener out there being like well my roof deck has has cooperative rules in my co-op no i'm talking about like the no trespassing fire alarm public housing rooftop right it it, it, it that's where like hunting down the last kid smoking a joint anywhere in a public building is much different than clearing out the vestibule of marijuana smoke when people come home from work. Right. But the vestibule stuff. Um, and I've, I've said this before. Uh, if you don't, if you decriminalize, it means you don't regulate. Um, the point about regulation and with drug policy, I point out specifically, you can either regulate informally but really to regulate mm -hmm. legally, you have to legalize it and then you can regulate regulate it. Um, in many of these issues, the so-called quality of life issues, um, it seems now we are moving to the sort of worst possible scenario, which is it's still technically criminal, um, though that's changing with, with marijuana. Uh, but we're basically saying we're not gonna regulate it at all. And that, that it's not even the pendulum swinging, it's, it's the pendulum, transporting to the other side. Um, and it's not necessarily, I don't care if some, someone smokes weed. Um, I do care if people complain about it. Uh, it's also, I'm not against, here's the other problem. If you, if someone is threatening and harassing somebody, let's go back to that kid, the proverbial kid on the proverbial mailbox who's not letting a woman put a letter in the mailbox. Um, a police officer may not shows up and, you know, has heard this from more than one person. Sometimes you got to get people for what you can get them on. You need something to get them on. And if that's because he's smoking a joint on the mailbox, well, that's great. But without that as a, again, that you need some legal authority to, with discretion um, to make pretextual stops even. Right. Um, but that's different than, you know, there's a, well, you know, you get, <laughs> The always no, example of, well, white people can drink wine in Central Park. Well, anyone can drink wine in Central Park if, if they behave. But yeah, there well, is. You worry, though, that like people on a blanket with a picnic basket drinking wine in Central Park in Sheep Meadow would be treated differently than than two, um, uh, you know, black folks sitting on a bench at the north end of the park drinking a bottle of wine, like cheaper, like, you know, cheaper wine. I think that's true. Right. I think that's a problem that like if you're on Sheep Meadow on a blanket with a basket drinking wine you know the cop might say have a great evening but then on a bench up at 110th street um you know maybe you know 21 22 year old uh couple out on a date drinking you know something much less expensive you'd probably get a ticket like i do think that's a problem mm -hmm. right i do think that's and that's what i mean about the fairness test right it's got to pass what i call the test of public reason you can't draw the line in ways that that citizens using the smell test and treat them differently. It isn't one of the ways to, to formalize, formalize the smell test um, is are people complaining about it? Does it make the public afraid? Yeah, sure. Part of that is true, right? No, if, if no one's calling about the couple on the bench on 110th street, no one's calling at the sheet meadow and it's something that's not objectively, you know, if either of them get into their car after drinking that bottle, then government gets back involved again, start driving. Right. right? But, but, but people, up until that point, no. But people in NYCHA are calling about kids in the lobby, partying mm -hmm. and, and smoking weed. And so that, but that's an important difference. Again, it's not just about the person and their act. It's about shared public and in this case, semi-public um, space. Yeah, and so the, the vestibule by New York City law is a public space. By New York State law is, is any space that a significant number of people have unobstructed access to that none of them own per se is a public space. Mm. So by definition. Um, I forgot to know when we started this, but I'm thinking we should maybe end it. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else you're dying to? Uh... No, um, I know this was a long meandering conversation, but you could see like one of the things we've been poor, bad about this, I guess a shameless plug for what in a year approximately would be my, my book on democratic policing. But I think we've talked about a lot of really important democratic principles here. We've touched on populism, informal social control, so formal social control, pluralism, like the government's authority to coerce, what ends it should do, what standards of fairness. Like, I think what gets, when we just concentrate on disparity or it, which is a critical thing to study, but we, if we, if it's all in terms of that, or it's all in terms of um, on the other hand, just crime rates and violence, we lose sight of like, I think we have yet to have the good discussion about like the democratic 
contours of policing, like really, because not even uh, Bittner, like Bittner's brilliant. I mean, and, and, and Goldstein, all these all these writers in the generations before us were brilliant. None of them really like hit it out of the park when it came to what um, policing owes a democracy and vice versa. And how that and how policing actually benefits a pluralist democracy and encourages pluralism. I'd love to see like that enter the discussion, right? right. Like when when Black Lives Matter sits down with whomever and lists their demands, I want to know like what I would love them to talk about pluralism. Like as Black Lives Matter, we believe in democratic pluralism. We believe that like there should there should be pluralistic conceptions of religion, of culture, of, of, of recreation, of education, of expression, and that all of those need to have a footing in our public spaces in a reasonable and respectful way. And one of the things we value is policing that doesn't trample it, but encourages it. I'd love to start that conversation. I don't think it started. No. Um, and I've said about other things, but this applies, like we still often don't have the, <clears throat> excuse me, we still often don't even have the language to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, uh, that's where you come in. Um, whether it's the, the grand book and academic article or the, um, <laughs> the op-ed well, that yeah. inspired this in the daily news about. Uh, the book that seven people will read. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, thanks so much, Brandon. It's been a pleasure. Uh, again, this is, uh, I'm Peter Moskos. I'm here with Brandon Del Pozo. And uh, there is uh, more information, as always, at qualitypolicing.com. And this, um, this has been Quality Policing. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for having me, Peter. This has been great. Wow.